Um, before we get started, um, the meeting will be conducted as an interview conversation with Ralph Fix, and we take about 40 minutes. And after that, we will open for, there will be a Q&A session um, opening for questions. And to those of you who are following us online, uh, you are invited to post any questions you might uh, want to make to, to, to Ralph Fix, either on Twitter, uh, using the hashtag Civita Frukost or on, on Facebook. And with the good help of my colleagues, we will uh, try to, to make sure that at least some of your questions are addressed. And we plan to round off uh, the, uh, this conversation at about nine o'clock. Now, Ralph Fix, your name cannot be said to be a household name in Norway, I'm <laughs> sure so you know. Unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> no, or at least this not will yet. change. This will it change. will change. Yes, but uh, so so I have to to say a few other words of introduction here. Um, uh, let me start with the with, with with the year now, 2017. That was the year that you took the initiative to found uh, the Center for Liberal Modernity in in Berlin. At the same year, you published a book. If you're going to talk about it today, I show it here in the German version in 2017. It's now been translated into English, and you have it in English there, I suppose. Yeah. With the title Think Defending Freedom. freedom. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and, and a subtitle as well, which is incidentally the same title as for this conversation. How can we win the fight for an open society? Um, before you started, before 2017, uh, you started this, you were for a long time the president of the Heinrich Böll Stiftung in Germany as a political foundation close to the Green Party. And uh, indeed, you have served the Green Party in several positions over the years. You have even been the co chair of the party. 1989-90, what a time. And um, um, also as Senator for Environment and City, City Development in Bremen. Um, I think in Germany, or at least my German friends tells me, uh, you are known to be a pioneer thinker uh, in a special way. Uh, you are a sort of a different kind of a liberal green voice in public debate, uh, concentrating very much on uh, in climate policies, in eco ecology issues, on innovation and market-oriented policies rather than prohibitions and restrictions. And that is one of your certainly been one one of you the the, the threads uh, through your writings lately as well. I think you even use the word green order liberalism to describe your position sometimes, which is interesting. So, with those introductory remarks, we should go, get down to business. So, so let us start. I, I think it would be appropriate to start actually with the first chapters of your book. Hmm. Um, because there, you, you try to you make an assessment of the state of the world in terms of freedom in terms of liberal democracy and the health of our societies and you and there is a sense of urgency in your in your analysis and your call for action to really stand up and fight for the open society and that was in 2017 and of course well since 2017 till now mm. a lot of things have happened so I wonder what, if you were going to write a new book or revise it or something, how, how different is it today? Can, can, you, can we start there? How urgent is it now? We certainly have a lot of odd thoughts and even all the personalities in high places around the world, which is not making the case for freedom and the liberal world order any easier, maybe. What, where are we now? I think... Things since uh, 2017 have even become <coughs> worse than better. Um, when I started the book, it was before the US presidential elections and before the British referendum on the, the, the Brexit. 
and everybody knows how things ended with Trump in the US and uh, the Brits leaving the European Union. Uh, and at the same time, also in this uh, years, we, we saw the rise of right-wing extremism, of uh, right-wing populism throughout Europe from Scandinavia to the Mediterranean Sea, even in economically Uh, quite prosperous countries um, like Norway, Sweden, or in Germany. Um, and this is uh, the flip side of the coin. Uh, we see the rise of authoritarian powers, especially China, challenging liberal democracy and uh, promoting an alternative model of government, promising Uh, prosperity and stability without democracy. And I think um, these two um, developments are reinforcing them each other. The term oil within liberal democracies, um, I would even say the crisis of liberal democracy in a lot of uh, Western countries and uh, the challenge from outside. If you take that, um, if you move on from, from that recognition of this double threat, if you will, that you present, uh, obviously they meet in many ways in what we sometimes call the, the, you know, the, the, the institutions around the world that we call in some the liberal world the liberal order. order. Yeah. Exactly. And... Um, And the stresses, can you say, how do you see this development, what kind of an impact does it have on the basic uh, strength of the, of, of the institutions that we sometimes take for granted? From everything from trade and the UN and the yeah. EU and so on. Maybe it's a, a useful thought exercise to remember for like a minute Uh, this magical year of 1990, when the Soviet Union collapsed and we saw this huge wave of democratic revolutions, uh, this strife for liberty, not only in Central Eastern Europe, all over the world. Remember China, the students' movement, the democracy movement, which was that brutally cracked down at the Tiananmen. Um, so this was like a period when, when Francis Fukuyama um, coined his famous phrase of the end of history. And of course, the meaning of, of that statement, the end of history, was not that everything will remain the same, nothing will uh, happen in the world. No, the, 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 the core of his analysis was that systemic competition is over. The competition between uh, this combination of liberal democracy and capitalism and um, the, the authoritarian um, alternative represented by the Soviet Union, uh, China, the communist China and uh, their allies. So, and, and this uh, expectation has turned out uh, as uh, totally wrong. Systemic competition is back. Um, even, I think, uh, more challenging than before because uh, China managed successfully to combine kind of totalitarian rule with uh, economic dynamics, uh, with innovation, with uh, the economic growth. Um, and at the same time, Uh, we have a crisis uh, of uh, liberal institutions in a lot of Western countries uh, who could expect what was happening in the United States, um, the incarnation of, of, of the West and the liberal world order now challenging its own principles. Um, so um, and, uh, this is really, uh, as you uh, already mentioned a kind of dramatic 
uh, crisis for, for liberal democracy. And uh, it's a very urgent situation to revive uh, not only our values, but our ability to act. Yeah? Liberal democracies have to deliver. They have to find convincing answers to the main challenges of our, of our time, globalization, the digital revolution, mm. uh, global migration, and climate change. Yeah, this is, uh, I think, at the core um, of uh, our, our political agenda now. Could you, um, expanding on that, would you say that our ability to handle the great challenges that we face, you mentioned many of them now, everything from the climate change to social, the new social questions, uh, divisions in society, inequality, um, mm. and so on. Our ability to, to solve those questions, if we don't, don't solve them within the West, that will not probably be a very good way to to, to uh, compete with the authoritarian uh, regime. I think today. this is one of the main root causes for this uproar, the populist uproar we see in, 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 in the West, that uh, the, the confidence of parts of our societies in our ability, in the ability, capacity of liberal democracies uh, to deal with rapid and transformative change. Uh, this confidence uh, has been, been shrinking dramatically. Uh, there had been some major uh, events uh, creating this uh, crisis of confidence, especially the financial crisis in 2008-2009. Um, but uh, also uh, the, the migration crisis in 2015. Um, the um, crisis of the multilateral institutions, uh, the World Trade Organization, the United Nations, uh, to deal with these uh, transformative uh, developments. Um, so it was a whole series of uh, events that, that uh, created this crisis within the liberal democracies and the rise of down authoritarian adversaries. Doesn't this really go back to, I mean, we, we, we can hardly, I suppose, imagine the, the liberal world order that we have been benefiting from for so long time without the West being in the lead, and indeed the very essence. I think we even have a, a citation in the beginning, beginning of your book by the historian, Hanish August Winkler, the historian of the West, um, about the importance of upholding and understanding and, and ownership of the core values that mm. really define the West and is underpinning those institutions and used to be doing that. And um, so... Um, and if the West is now hurting itself, or even having un-Western or anti-Western precedents in high places, mm. um, where should we start? The West was never only uh, a geographical alliance and um, not only a security alliance um, represented by NATO. It was, as you said, an alliance of values, and uh, it represented a certain spirit, a spirit of liberty, of democracy, of equal opportunities, uh, of social upward mobility uh, for everybody, um, the balance of powers, the plurality, not only of our political life, also our cultural diversity, um, and if we lose um, these values and uh, say the, the, the emotional uh, dynamics uh, of, of uh, that liberal uh, democracy, um, we will come more and more into the defense. So it is about regaining, say, grand narratives um, 
what is progress in the 21st century? What is it about? Yeah, how can we bridge the gap uh, between environmental protection, uh, mitigating uh, than climate change, and an open liberal society with a pluralism of lifestyles? Uh, how can we uh, restore the promise of equal opportunities in our uh, societies? Uh, how can we maintain a balance between cultural diversity and uh, common values, common democratic uh, values we all believe in? So uh, this is not only about pragmatic, technocratic, political solutions, um, this is a time of big change, uh, which needs uh, big ideas, grand ideas. But I suppose also ideas that a lot of people can be in contact with, be included in, and actually drive. Because in the end, the way the world is moving is really up to all of us. And I think for a long time... Um, underestimated um, that especially in, in times of turbulent change um, the need for a certain degree of security and stability in our societies is growing and if liberal minds don't find liberal answers to these conservative needs for security, for belonging, for stability, um, the vacuum will be filled uh, by authoritarian, by nationalistic, or also by traditional left-wing um, mm. political movements. Uh, it's, when you mentioned this, it, it's quite a paradox. Uh, I, I was thinking now about the, you have even a program at your center about um, the new right, perhaps um, in a European setting, and it's old thoughts and how old thinking from the hmm. 1920s and so on has suddenly gained currency in a way in the in the authoritarian nationalist uh, right wing answers to this. I, I, we, to I, a certain degree, of course, history never repeats itself. But to a certain degree, we are back um, in a similar historical situation than after World War I. Uh, with, um, at the one hand, uh, you have uh, accelerated technological change and technological innovation, um, cultural, uh, kind of cultural revolution also in, in, in these times. Uh, you had the rise of the, the feminist uh, movement uh, reclaiming equal rights and opportunities uh, for women and challenging the patriarchalic uh, family order. Um, you had a growing uh, diversity in societies and a growing equality. Um, today also we see this division of our societies between uh, winners and losers uh, of um, globalization and of the digital revolution. Yeah, you have those parts of our societies well educated, internationally connected, multilingual, um, very familiar with new technologies, uh, which are benefiting uh, from these new de developments and the others who feel threatened. Hmm. Uh, and this is one of the defining. Uh, than divisions uh, also politically in, in, in our societies. And uh, um, if the so-called liberal elites, uh, the globalists, the cosmopolitan uh, parts uh, of our societies neglect the fears and uh, the doubts and uh, the needs of the others in our society, if we only see them as some backwarded, uh, old-fashioned uh, young people who have to step uh, aside and uh, give free way for 
uh, globalization and uh, uh, the the achievements of uh, the multicultural society, um, then we will slip into more and more political polarization. So um, they, we have we have to um, uh, find political answers for also those who are skeptical against developments we see as uh, progress and we see as achievements uh, of uh, the liberal world. Mm. Is that also a description, as you see it, of the great challenge to liberalism itself these days? That you, the liberal idea to be relevant yeah. and indeed be inclusive enough and effective enough to carry to carry us forward, uh, we'll need to take more care of the, the issues you are mentioning now. Uh, yeah, for a long, long period, I think in the 80s and 90s, um, uh, liberalism in the, the eyes of the, the, the public, especially in uh, Western Europe, in continental Europe, was reduced to market liberalism. So, and today neoliberalism has become a kind of anathema. Yeah, so if, if you are coined as neoliberal, if you are framed as neoliberal, you are, you are dead. Um, then in spite of the, the total different origin of uh, neoliberal thinking, which was uh, the answer to the rise of authoritarianism in the 30s, uh, and the kind of renewal of uh, liberal thinking. Um, and I think we, we today uh, we are facing uh, a similar challenge than, than liberals in the, the 30s and 40s, uh, that we have to revive uh, the liberal thinking. We have um, to, to find new answers uh, to the fundamental challenges of our times. And um, if I'm looking, for instance, to climate change and uh, the, the ecological, the global ecological crisis, uh, the loss of uh, biodiversity, uh, the water crisis in large parts of uh, the world, the loss of fertile soil, um, liberals are not very, uh, I would say, outspoken and they don't have an image of uh, being uh, ecologically very competent and um, in the contrary. Um, so, and if liberals don't find liberal answers to the, the ecological challenge uh, and, and, the, and to climate change, they will lose uh, support, especially in the younger generation. Uh, which is very much um, then driven by, by environmental fears. And um, same with um, the promise of equal opportunities and an inclusive model of economic growth. Economic growth in, 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 in parts of our academic youth uh, also has become a very a, a negative thing. Yeah? So you have these degrowth movement uh, in, in, a, in a lot of uh, academic uh, young uh, circles. Uh, why? Because it is, it's not only seen as environmental destructive, which is the case, um, but, but also that growth no longer is um, the uh, vehicle uh, for social progress for the majority. And these are serious uh, than questions. You could also say these are serious uh, shortcomings um, of, of liberal politics. And uh, so we, we have to, uh, we need a certain dose of self-critical reflection, what went wrong and what do we have to change uh, to make uh, liberal ideas and liberal politics uh, attractive again. Mm. I'm reminded, you know, uh, first time I met you, I there was actually at a, a small meeting in Chillingen in November 2018, a meeting to commemorate the uh, 
a famous meeting in 1938 called the Walter Lippmann Colloquium. Yeah. It was a self-critical reappraisal of liberalism uh, having to reform to be relevant for uh, the, after the Second World War and so on. Um, and of course, you said the same there. You, I think you you end you had an opening talk there where you ended it with the words <laughs> "liberalism is dead." Uh, period, uh, and then you continued, but long live liberalism. So you seems to be I, your whole book is really much about it can be interpreted in a way as uh, an attempt to reform a new liberalism. Yeah. Because you seem to be saying that without liberalism, we, we don't have any chance to succeed, even with environmental policies and with climate change. And there, could we go back to your Green Party? Because you have been in the battle, there has been a battle there as well, between the Dirichis and the eco-socialist leanings, or even maybe some authoritarian leanings, and more liberal leanings. You certainly are seen to be in the latter camp. <laughs> How has that journey been? Um, let's go first, go back briefly to, to this paradox with liberalism is that long live liberalism. So of course, liberal parties and liberal policies can fail. And to a certain extent, uh, many of them failed in the, in the, in the, in the last, uh, than 20 years and lost a lot of political credit. So liberal policies and uh, liberal thinking has become a minority issue in most of uh, Western countries. But I am deeply convinced uh, after some, um, let's say, moves in my political life, from the anti-authoritarian revolt at the end of the, the 60s, the strife for individual liberty to the radical left, and slowly approaching green thinking, entering the Green Party, um, facing the democratic revolution of the 90s, and the anti-liberal counter-revolution now. I'm deeply convinced that not only liberal thinking centered around the dignity of every human being and individual liberty and the idea of responsible uh, self-government, of plurality and the balance of powers. Um, This is the quintessence um, we have to defend uh, against the, the totalitarian uh, temptation which is returning uh, than today, Hmm. Uh, but that liberal democracies finally are best equipped to deal with uh, the the challenges uh, challenges of the the modern world, because liberal democracies inherently are more creative. They, They are more able to find innovative solutions uh, to uh, critical than challenges. Uh, this is at least the promise, uh, and this is what I am I'm still hoping for, but it's not enough um, to stick uh, to, to these ideas and to these values. We have uh, to find concrete political answers. Um, as I said at the beginning, we have to deliver. Uh, finally, uh, there is it's an, competi- an, an, an output competition we are in mm-hmm. between liberal democracies and uh, authoritarian uh, systems of like, different colors. Mm. If you can take up the, the thread there from the Green Party a little bit in Germany, m- many people with perhaps also in Norway have understood that there has been a fundamental change for over some years where the public support for the Green Party has changed quite a lot. It has increased in popularity. I think it used to be said that the Green Party was the biggest party for the people under 30 earlier. uh, And an article, I think, uh, a few months ago was saying, oh, now it's the biggest party for everyone under 60. Hmm. And 
is this this is a new in Germany at least this is a new wave or a new political uh, change going on and um, but the Green Party perhaps was didn't start where it is today did it has it changed as well of course. In, in the direction of course I would say what would so, you say you know I'm, I'm not a spokesperson for uh, the Green Party. I'm still a member, but uh, I don't have any active uh, political functions or political mandates. Um, but still, um, of course, uh, I'm in my heart and uh, in my, 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 my brain, um, I'm sticking to uh, green ideas, especially that uh, the, the environmental crisis is at least one of the major challenges for uh, the 21st uh, century uh, and that we have to reinvent um, our economies uh, and, and, and what the modernity is about, yeah? that uh, we, we can no longer expand uh, economic prosperity and uh, social progress on the expense mm. uh, of the natural uh, resources. And um, But green politics was never only about uh, these environmental issues. From the beginning, it had also a very strong element of um, cultural diversity, of minority rights, uh, of uh, self-determination, um, of social uh, like equality, equal opportunities, um, and the equilibrium between these different um, then values and undercurrents of, of the green movement changed over the last uh, 30 years all the time. Mm. So I would say... Um, in Germany, the Greens quite successfully, and in some other European countries, quite successfully changed the public mindset and also to a certain degree um, changed the politics. Uh, a lot of green programmatic issues now have become mainstream issues, but at the same time, um, the democratic experience, taking part in parliaments and um, taking part in, in, in governments, mm. changed the Greens from um, a systemic oppositional force at the beginning, um, challenging also uh, parliamentarism and um, um, the market economy to a more um, evolutionary mm. political party uh, with a reformist agenda. Today, the German Greens are clearly a reformist party. Mm. But in your book, you also uh, we also encounter some problematics uh, around the yeah. certain line of green thinking that is in the very restrictionist, you call it eco-puritanism, mm -hmm. the temptation to go into a very an authoritarian way to, 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 to take down growth and to control everything. And yet even yeah. think you, you, you pay a visit actually also, I think, in that book to uh, all the way back to the Club of Rome and the Limits to Growth book and uh, and even the Norwegian there was co-authoring it on uh, Jürgen Randers and Dennis Meadows yeah yes uh, uh, you, you you are you pay them a quite a critical visit don't you yeah I I reread um, this famous report to the club of Rome the limits to growth from 1972 which was a, a very important a book for me in the 70s to turn green. I reread it uh, now when I wrote uh, Van Defending Freedom. And mm -hmm. I wondered why um, previously I didn't recognize the authoritarian uh, tendency, which from the beginning 
was part of, of uh, this report. Because uh, if you see the environmental crisis as the result of economic growth and um, your conclusion is we have to limit not only economic growth, we have to limit production and consumption. We have to limit even uh, the reproduction of uh, people. Um, so then you end with uh, these kind of control and command uh, thinking. And this mm. has an, an inherent authoritarian tendency. And it is not by accident that um, one of the prominent thinkers of uh, the, the Green Movement, who has also been part of the uh, team of Dennis Meadows in 1972, Jorgen Randers, mm. Uh, openly uh, uh, sympathize with the Chinese model because he doubts that liberal democracies will be able to enforce um, the um, restrictions which he thinks are needed um, to uh, stop climate change and uh, to, to um, uh, contain the, the environmental crisis. And I think this is basically a wrong approach to the uh, environmental crisis. Mm. It is not just a matter of the size of our economies and the, the volume of production consumption, but of the way um, we are organizing the, our energy system, mobility, the industry, and our, our agricultural production. So, in my view, we need a, a, a new uh, than green industrial revolution, um, moving away from fossil energies uh, to, to alternative uh, sources of uh, energy, finally, I would say uh, a hydrogen uh, based uh, than economy, uh, reinventing mobility, uh, turning our, our industries to a new model of um, cycling um, than economies, uh, zero waste economies. And this is very much about creative solutions. This is about innovation and this needs I would say even more economic dynamics, more investment and more innovation. Uh, otherwise, we will not be able uh, to balance a world of 10 billion people in 2040 or 2050 with uh, the um, uh, ecological boundaries uh, we have to, to be aware of. Yes, and I think you there are saying uh, some words about this green order liberalism that you, you uh, as a way forward to incentivize using the market in order to, yeah. to, to solve means, the climate crisis as a very different, diversified, yeah. decentralized, and, in, 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 uh, and, and taking on board uh, the liberal order as a, as 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 a so as the term asset, liberal not, not a liability. Yeah, the term liberal order, of course, is a reference uh, to um, the the idea that that markets need a political and legal framework. So mm -hmm. it is not about uh, regulation or no regulation. It is about smart regulation. Um, uh, promoting uh, then innovation and uh, the ecological uh, transformation of our economies by uh, the markets yeah, and by the ability of markets hmm. um, to set free the initiative of millions and millions of people uh, to um, we, we need a, a new wave of, I would say, green entrepreneur, entrepreneurship um, and social and ecological responsibility, entrepreneurship. Uh, we need the competition uh, for the best solutions. Uh, so it is not about uh, taming uh, and uh, um, replacing 
uh, the, the markets by a kind of state-controlled uh, uh, economy, but it is about an intelligent, smart framework, especially the uh, internalization of uh, external costs. Yeah, this is this is the very base, uh, the fundament of the the ecological crisis in economic terms. Mm. That uh, the the ecological costs of our current a way of production and consumption are not included in the price mechanism. Hmm. So ecotaxes uh, and um, uh, setting a, pr a price on CO2 hmm. uh, emission, uh, emissions, uh, taxing waste, uh, taxing natural consumption in a, in a general, in a broader sense, this is one of the key um, answers to the, the ecological crisis. Uh, before we um, kind of round off and open for questions in just a few minutes, uh, we have so far been talking about the state of the world and the challenges ahead and, and ways to go forward without coming into the present state we are in, the experiment we are living through called the corona crisis. Mm. Um, of course, that has come on top of other driving forces or it's going to change a lot of our way how we perceive uh, both the world and, and 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 how we should do policies and so on and there has been also some the what what, what do you think is the impact of the corona crisis on the the urgency yeah. that you the, the whole your whole project very interesting a reinforcer or has it you know how do you see that very interesting question. I think for, for liberal minds, the corona crisis is a um, very serious long challenge we have to think about because, um, especially as far as I can see in uh, Dang Western Europe, um, the corona crisis um, promoted and fueled the idea of the protective state. Mm. Uh, the strong protective state which takes care uh, for, for, for the society. And uh, it's true that the corona crisis um, I think was a lesson that uh, we need strong public institutions, um, especially public health care system, um, but uh, the meaning of, of the public good in, the, in general. This is something we have to think about it. Uh, the, the value of um, modern um, public education uh, system providing equal opportunities to every child uh, and the opportunity to grow, not only physically, but also as a person, um, the meaning, the importance of our cultural institutions, uh, especially in, in a period when uh, we have to regain our understanding of the modern world, culture plays a very important role, but also the importance of um, public security um, so I think uh, if, if liberals neglect uh, the importance of public institutions, if liberals are repeating the mantra of uh, privatization, of uh, deregulation, uh, lowering uh, taxes, uh, and uh, turn a blind eye to the, the importance of public institutions, also for um, social inclusion and uh, uh, empowering people um, to um, play an active part uh, in the modern technological and, 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 and cultural world. Uh, this, is, this would be deadly wrong. Uh, so we have to recalibrate, let's say, the, the, the balance uh, between the welfare state and uh, um, these kind of public institutions and 
private uh, than prosperity and uh, self-responsibility. And of course, the risk of the current development is that um, more and more uh, the state is seen as the only actor um, and the only uh, last resort for, for security and that the liberal element of uh, self-responsibility of um, uh, the, the, a strong civil society uh, is more and more fading away. So um, I think the, the corona crisis is a very interesting example. Um, and perhaps also a very exa interesting example of, I mean, we talk about the pandemic and we talk about many of the questions and the big challenges in the world today do not know any borders in a way, you know, that is it also on display now, really the, the big challenge of we have to come together across countries uh, in order to really and finally. Tell. Yeah. The, of course, initially there was ref, uh, this reflex. Uh, we are closing our borders. We are, um, retreating uh, into the, this, uh, the national um, cocon. Um, the, the national state uh, is the, the um, um, our last resort of uh, security in times of uh, a, a crisis. Mm -hmm. But I think meanwhile, uh, we rediscovered uh, not only that the virus and uh, the, the uh, biology uh, doesn't respect any national borders, but that we only can manage um, these kind of global challenges. And the pandemic is a global challenge by international cooperation. And I'm now a little bit more optimistic uh, that maybe the corona experience uh, will uh, strengthen uh, the, the idea that we need not less but more international cooperation and integration, global integration. Uh, so the whole idea of deglobalization, I think, is a, is a mistake. Of course, we need a kind of recalibration of globalization. Uh, and uh, we need more crisis uh, than prevention. Mm. And we should not be dependent uh, from China in, in the degree we are now. Uh, but the idea of um, global uh, division of labor, uh, global trade, um, global technological lung exchange, um, this is a driver for not only prosperity, but also for stability. Well, it seems like you are doing uh, another invitation for us all to do as Karl Popper once said, that uh, we only have one way to move forward, and that's into the open society if we're going to really uh, solve our problems. And you're quite optimistic uh, in a way. I, I suppose that is conditional on our efforts and our ability and our uh, work to, to, to really fight for um, solutions that will make the world better in more than one sense and inclusive, more inclusive and more liberal. I think we should open for, for, for some questions. If we have any questions from those who are following us, if you don't have any questions, or if people are, uh, we haven't, right? So we should then we could uh, perhaps. Um, I mentioned Karl Popper. I mean, that's another one. You you have a citation in the beginning of your book, of course. Um, and um, uh, has he been a, a source of um, inspiration for you? His thinking about the. Um, that we move forward in terms of having open institutions, both democracy and the market, that we are not, not closed and the future is open, therefore we mm. are basically bound to be optimists. We're going to do something better. Yeah, I, um, you, you already um, 
made this connection between the concept of an open society and um, the promise and the trust, I would say, that the future is open. The whole idea of uh, an open society um, is deeply connected with this confidence that we are able to shape our future by a combination of uh, responsibility of every individual. Uh, every individual can make a difference mm -hmm. by uh, his or her uh, actions. And uh, the collective action uh, of uh, the Democratic Republic. So, uh, and this I would say is a combination between Karl Popper and Hannah Arendt um, Hannah Arendt with her very strong um, uh, emphasis for um, collective action and even uh, public debate is a kind of then collective action. Mm -hmm. um, the, the struggle uh, for the better idea, for uh, then better solutions uh, to the, the challenges we are facing as societies. Um, and uh, that, that in this kind of public uh, interaction, uh, this is the, the, the soil for, for the birth of progress. Mm. Yeah. So uh, progress is not just a result of, um, let's say, scientific, uh, research or technological innovation it's a result of public interaction mm. and uh, so I think we, we have to uh, combine uh, the, the idea of mm. liberal of, of, of uh, individual freedom individual liberty individual self-responsibility with the sense for public institutions and collective action I think this is the driver of um, political and, and societal progress. Speaking of which, I think uh, many of the viewers are, who are seeing this online will see that you have a rather symbolic background. <laughs> in, <laughs> uh, there you are. Uh, in uh, It's the Martin Luther King Memorial. Yeah. Yeah. Um, speaking about making a difference and engaging publicly and fighting. Yeah. Um, we have to do more like that. He is, he is one of my all-time young heroes. Uh, I made this uh, photo in one of my uh, last visits in, uh, to Washington. And uh, if we can travel again, and if you ever have the opportunity to uh, go to Washington, go to the um, Memorial Park um, and have a look to the Martin Luther King Memorial or to the Roosevelt Memorial. Very impressive because this is the spirit of liberty and uh, as you mentioned, the spirit of public engagement um, and the confidence uh, that we can change things, we can change our societies to the better um, by this kind of uh, collective action hmm. but collective uh, in the sense of the cooperation and um, the, the, the common action of individuals um, self-thinking and self-responsible than individuals it's not about this kind of um, collectivism uh, that we all are, that we all are one. No, we we are not all one. We are different, but as different individuals, we have to find um, then common ground, uh, common values, and um, a common purpose. Hmm. Well, I think those are very fitting words for rounding off. Really, you even gave us a few. Uh, tips on when the open society really opens up again after the corona crisis you get some travel tips there as well ralph fix thank you so much for joining us this morning and for sharing with us your important thoughts on fight on the fight for freedom and the open society 
in these uh, very special times. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, um, Peter. Uh, we, 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 we tried really hard <laughs> to, to, to make this conversation possible even before yeah. the corona crisis. And I'm happy that we finally managed it. Very good. Thank you so much. Before we start, we we'll end totally here. We, I would just like to say I would th thank the audience for following us as well. I hope you had a nice morning and and uh, was interesting for you. And let me also finally uh, remind you uh, that uh, there's a new the next Civita breakfast meeting will be take place on June the third, and uh, it will raise the question. Is there a need to reform our social security system? So thank you all for today and have a very nice day. Thank you. Thank you very much.